and good morning. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us your servants grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast and steadfast in this faith and worship and bring us at last to see you in your one and eternal glory, O Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit live and reign one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of Genesis. When God had created the heavens and the earth and everything that is in them, then he said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast on the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he made, and indeed, it was very good. The word of the Lord. Amen. We'll say our psalm today responsively by half verse. O oh Lord, our governor, how exalted is your name in all the world. Out of the mouths of infants and children, your majesty is praised above the heaven. You have set up a stronghold against your adversaries to quell the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have set in their courses, what is man that you should be mindful of him? The son of man that you should seek him out. 
You have made him but little lower than the angels. You adorn him with glory and honor. You give him mastery over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and whoever walks in the paths of the sea. O Lord, our governor, how exalted is your name in all the world. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him there, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the fellowship of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Would, um... Ken, do you mind grabbing that basket out there um, right outside the door, please? Thank you. Good morning. Today's Trinity Sunday. It's the day um, that most of us preachers um, stand in front of you and try to uh, uh, form, formulate, formulate some, some theology, some doctrine of the Holy Trinity, which is just, it's, it's, it's just not something that any of us can really do. The doctrine of the Holy Trinity is, is one of the one of those doctrines that that what we have to first and foremost say is that it's something that we really just don't seek to understand. Um, One of my favorite stories about that, I I may have told you this before, is a story about the bishop visiting this small congregation in a rural area of, I think it was Alabama, and the bishop is doing his treatise on the holy, on the undivided, holy and undivided trinity, and there's this little boy running, jumping around in one of the pews, and the bishop says, Son, tell me about the Holy, the Holy Trinity. And the little boy, little sheepish, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He said, I didn't hear you. What did you say? Father, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He said, Son, what did you say? And the little boy said, that's okay, Bishop. It's a holy mystery. <laughs> what, what, I, what, I, what I find difficult about what we find difficult in the church about our descriptions of the Holy Trinity is that oftentimes what we do is we, we describe the Holy Trinity as, as God who is out out there. And and in order for it, we do that because it seems if we separate God from us, it is much easier to describe God as a thing. But what we do when we talk about the Holy Trinity is talk about God as three persons. In other words, there is a certain reality, a, a material reality that keeps us from thinking of God only in terms of the abstract. So God is living, material, and real in this world with us, and to be in this world and with us is to pull us into the relationship that exists within God for us. And we understand oftentimes why, at least theologically, why we would separate
separate ourselves from God. And the reason we think is because we think of God as eternal. God, God is moving for eternity, and we are finite creatures, and we do not do that. But the reality is, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the Son, the Father, Creator, the Redeemer, the Sustainer, in, the, in that fellowship, even in its eternality, we are called into that, and we exist in that eternal existence of God. I know that sounds so obfuscated, but the point is that whoever God is, we are with God always. So what I do on Trinity Sunday, um, because everything's a mystery, um, is try to answer some questions and just go ahead and make a fool of myself from the get-go. So last night we had some folks, and a couple from this morning too, um, we had some folks uh, do some questions. So I'll, I'll, I have some of those, and I have, it looks like, a couple from this morning as well. Uh, if you have a question, you're welcome to just speak up. Uh, so the question is, um, why is the piece placed in the middle of the service? A liturgical question. Um, actually, uh, this is what I know. Um, the piece is placed in the middle of the service uh, because what we do after we've heard the, word, heard the Word of God and responded to the Word of God, not only in Scripture but in also in, uh, in a proclamation of a sermon, right after that we say our prayers, and then before the piece, typically except during Easter, um, before the piece we say a confession. And they say that confession so that we can not only be right with God, but also be right with others for the things we've done, left undone. Um, and after that moment, after we have been reconciled to God and to each other, it is at that time then when we are only able to be at peace within ourselves, with each other, and with God. And when we are at peace, forgiven, in right relationship with each other and God, it's at that point that we are able to share a holy meal. So the peace is placed in the middle of the service so that we can finish our confessional scriptural lives and move into other things. Oh my God. How do we not despair in what is happening in our world? Um, prayerfully? To, to exist in the world is to exist in a place that is not perfect. And when we exist in a place that is not perfect and realize our own imperfectness, um, then what we have to do is to begin to try to live into something that is healed. And so we try to live into that which is healed all the while while being healed and trying to heal a, 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 broken, a broken world. It is not easy to stay away from despair and fear. It is very difficult. It is more difficult to do that by ourselves than it is to do that in community. So if we are able to hold ourselves up in prayer and in hopefulness, then, then with the presence of God with us, not just us, but the whole world, and in the hope of something that is better than we currently are, and in the confidence that God is leading this world into some sort of perfection, some sort of divine, holy relationship with each other and with God, at that moment, perhaps we can not despair in anything. Are angels God's secret, secret agents? Are angels God's secret agents? Um, I don't know how secret they are, but certainly they're agents. Uh, the, the word for angel, angels in the New Testament is messenger, um, much like uh, the word prophet is in, in the Old Testament. And so I, I don't know much, much how to say much about angels other than I really do think they exist. And there's a whole, there's a whole study, study of angels in the church. It's called angelology. So um, somebody likes to talk about angels as being some reality. But I do know this about, um, about angels, and this comes to me from an 8-year-old. Um, when asked uh, about angels um, so, and what they look like, uh, a little 8-year-old at the school where I used to be in Columbia, South Carolina, he said, I don't know, but angels must be scary looking because every time we talk about them, everybody's always in fear. <laughs> what? Oh, my God. Another one. What does it mean to be joyful? 
So a lot of scripture, especially in, in John, um, in John's gospel, um, uh, points to the fact that, um, that Jesus was here so that, um, that, we may be, that we may be live in joy and that in him we may be joyful. So what does it mean to be joyful? I think, I think it means, um, much like it does, it means, it means not to live in despair, but to know that God is doing something good for us and all of us. So to be joyful is, only, is, also, is to live in hope. But also to be joyful, there's, there's, a, um, there's a wonderful guy, um, Bessel van der Kalk is his name. He, he, he's, a, he's a Swedish, a fin, Finnish, um, uh, 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 I think he's a psychiatrist. He's also somewhat of a theo, theologian. Um, he, he's one of those people who says, we don't have to be thankful for everything. You don't have to be thankful for an earthquake or for a, a premature death or, or something that seems bad. We're, we don't have to thank God for those things. But as those things exist, we can be joyful in each of the moments that it's given to us to live and to work through the pain and suffering of this world and to live into the happiness and the joy that does exist at times. So I think, it, I think to be joyful means to have a realistic view of life and to not live separated from what the world truly is. Uh, God, what's wrong with you people? These are hard. What, who, who, what is the concept of God? Um, the Trinity Sundays, this is awesome, so it's a good Trinity Sunday question. Uh, uh, God is not a concept. Uh, it, it, there, there's, there's, um, God is described, I said that, God is described as, as three Persons. It's, it's a living thing. God, God, the life that God calls us into, the self that God calls us into, it, is, is not conceptual. In fact, if you try to think of it conceptually, like most of us do on Trinity Sunday, then we, it defies the conceptions that either of us had, have. There's a wonderful line from a lady, uh, Ellen Davis, Dr. Ellen Davis, who's at Duke Divinity School. She said this. She said, it is what it is. She's talking about God and church and everything else. It is what it is, and it's more than that. And so... Whatever our concept of God and whatever we think we know about God, it is more than what we see. It is more than what we understand. It's not a concept. It's a living reality. I thought I did pretty good on that one, you have to admit. Um, Oh, my gosh. How should we read the Bible? A theologian I heard recently said, um, uh, when asked in an interview, how, 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 do, how, how do we bring ourselves to read the Bible? And, and, he, and his response was, um, back and forth. Um, and what he meant by that was to, to read the Old Testament and the New Testament together, back and forth, to see how each relates to the other and see how each illuminates of the other. We oftentimes, especially in, in, in our uh, uh, Christian lives, we tend to think oftentimes as the Old Testament as history, which is not bad to think of it in that way. I mean, we've got four books that are mostly historical, First and Second Kings, First and Second Samuel, for sure, Chronicles as well. Um, all, all those are historical, seem, seemingly historical books, but they're also theological, and more than that, they're relational. So, so a, as we read the, the Bible, um, we don't just read to see how things were with God and God's people, but we read that to see how things are and then to and relate the life that we are called into through Jesus, through a, a redemptive being. We, we read the Old Testament, as Christians, we read the Old Testament through the lens of, of healing and, and, and redemption. Uh, why does the Bible, why do we refer to God as He? Uh, God, God is not a he or a she or an it, um, uh, we, we, but there is a reason why we refer to, to God as in, in person, um, and, the, and the reason is, is because we don't want to, to put ourselves in the rut of thinking of God as an abstract thing. Um, if we, if, we remove our, if we remove God from the person language, then God becomes an it, and God is not an it. 
Um, we talk about God, it, it, I mean, we talk about God as Father and Son and, and, and Holy Spirit, all which seem to be very, very male-oriented um, um, persons. Um, but in the Old Testament, the, the theology behind um, that, as patri patriarchal as it sounds, there is some good theology that, fo that, that falls in line uh, with that. Um, God was seen as a, an eternal Father who was perfect in his relationship with his children. And the conception of that is done very well in the New Testament with um, the story of the prodigal son. And you remember in the prodigal son, the son leaves um, and, and goes off and squanders everything that his father had ever given him. And then when he came to himself, I love that line, when he came to himself and had nothing and was about to starve to death, he, 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 he thought that perhaps maybe he could come home. Um, and as a son, he, he came home, and you remember the story how, how he, 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 it seems as though he was rehearsing to himself what he would say to his father. And when he, when he got home, um, he, he said, Father, I've sinned against you and, 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 and everything that you've ever been for me and all that. And his father said, I'll, I'll have none of that. You are my son. I am your father. I always love you. I have always loved you. Um, and that, I think, is sort of the basis of, of the theology of, of fatherhood in, in the Old Testament. And there's also the reality that some of our fathers were not necessarily um, paragons of good father, fatherliness. Um, and and, and we, don't mean to, we don't mean to to speak past that when we talk about God as father. Um, we don't mean to speak past it when we talk about God as he, and we don't mean to be uninclusive. Um, but we do mean to say that God is somebody. Um, anyway, so... <laughs> Sorry. Um, this is from my from last night, I think. Um, what is God's favorite band? What is God's favorite band? Well, of course... The definitive answer about that is U2. Um, God's favorite band is the rock group U2. And I know this to be fact because God told me this um, in all my years of having this, this infatuation with, if, if not unhealthy love of this, this group called U2. And the lyrics, most particularly of, 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 their, of, their, of their singer Bono and the guitar player The Edge. Um, even the guy's mother calls him The Edge. So um, th these two lyrical and musical presences and that band ha has been formative in my life. I actually think about... Um, actually think about everything in my life based on when a U2 song came out. So the first song I ever heard by them was in 1980 off an album that was called Boy. And so ever since then, um, everything that ever came out by them, I had to go buy and devour. Um, and, and, and over time, I believe, um, I, I began to discover, and it took me longer than it should have, that this group is actually very, very deeply steeped. Their lyrics and their music is deeply um, steeped in Scripture. And one of the... Um, where this comes out for me, where, where it hit me hardest um, was when I began to hear songs like, um, like this uh, from them, um, Rejoice, Gloria, the Psalm 40, uh, I still haven't found what I'm looking for, I have seen, well, I have spoke with the tongue of angels, angels, I have seen the hand of the devil. It was warm in the night. I mean, all, all, this, all this seriously, um, seriously uh, scriptural God language. Another song, Acrobat, um, when, I was, when I was lost and had an opera in my head, your love was a light bulb hanging over my bed. All of this, script, all of this scriptural lyrics, I mean, it just kind of just pulled me in. And so um, I, I think um, God's favorite band is my favorite you, you, you too. Um, we talk about the Trinity um, in all kinds of ways, and, and one of the things I think is, is interesting uh, uh, about our scripture this morning and, and what it says, um, when God created um, humankind, it says, we, we, let, us create, um, let us create them in our image. And I don't know what that really means, um, and there's all kinds of he Hebrew um, um, conceptions uh, of that, Jewish conceptions of that. Scripture says, if you don't know any of that stuff, if you just read the Scripture for what it is, Scripture says that, um, that after God had created everything and, be, and had created the creatures of the earth and everything that is in the earth, God said, let us make humankind in our own image. 
And so I don't know what God's talking about there with the us, but it seems as though if you just read the scripture that the us is God and the creatures of God. And God says, let us make them in our humans in our image, which says to me, we are made not only in the likeness and image of God, but in the substance and essence of God as it is in creation. What I find really interesting, if we read just past where we stopped this morning, there's a lovely line there. We're talking about the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve particularly. God says, and this is not just about Adam and Eve, God says, it is not good for us to be alone. In other words, we were created in the image and likeness and substance and essence of God for relationships. There's a lovely line by, and I've said it to you a million times, and I hope, I hope we all remember it. Um, presiding Bishop Michael Curry, who was in North Carolina for 10 years as bishop, I have to throw that out every time. He says, if it's not about love, it's not about God. Don't ever forget that. I think that's the best description of God there ever was, best description of the church, and talk about God and talk about the church. It's not about love. It's not about God. And if it is about God, then it is about relationship. Loving relationship. There's a wonderful description, though, of, of, um, of the Trinity um, found in, in uh, Frederick Buechner's writings. Um, Frederick Buechner says, if, if, if the doctrine of the Trinity as one in three uh, t- t- tends to just um, blow your mind and you don't understand it, he says, um, t- take a look in the mirror some, someday. Um, there is, as you look in the mirror, there is this, this hidden internal self that you, that you know, only you know, and those know whom you choose, and those who you choose to communicate it know. So there's this internal shared reality that you choose to share it with other people. Then there is um, this sort of invisible being, this invisible face that is a reflection of that internal reality. And then there is the invisible power that each of us has to communicate our internal reality in such a way that those we communicate it to don't just know merely about us, but in some sense, we become a part of who they are. And then he goes to say, and what you're looking looking at is clearly and indivisibly the one and only you. I said earlier, um, um, it, it is what it is. We say that all the time. Um, it is what it is, yes, and it's more than that. And so whatever our conception of God, whatever our understanding, whatever our understanding of the Trinity, whatever it is that we think, however it is we think of God, God is, as redemption, God as forgiveness, God as acceptance, God as, as spirit, spirit, God as love, Whatever our conception, our understanding of God is, God is so much more than that. God is so much more than that that it would blow our minds if we were begin to even understand it. So we don't live in understanding. We live in knowledge of love. Amen. I can't find my thing. Please stand. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. 
We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Almighty God, you have revealed to your church your eternal being of glorious majesty and perfect love as one God in trinity of persons. Give us grace to continue steadfast in the confession of this faith and constant in our worship of you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Have mercy upon us, Father, in your compassion for sins known and unknown, things done and left undone, and so uphold us by your Spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name, Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you.